Greetings, fellow Earthlings, and welcome to Tales from the Hoop, a podcast dedicated to diving into the weird, wild, and wacky stories from basketball history. I'm your host, Ricky Freck, and today I will be telling a story about a legendary NBA center to my brother, Matthew Freck. Mm, Okay, so now we're going to have a couple things here up at the top, the most important of which is explaining what this podcast is actually about. I know I said it's the weird, wild, and wacky stories, so basically what this is going to be is every... mm, I'm going to say every couple of weeks, hopefully, but it could be longer. We're going to get together. We're going to dive deep into a story from basketball history that most people probably don't know. In fact, I would argue that the person getting the story told to them is not, they're not going to know what it is ahead of time. They're going to have no idea what the topic is going to be about. And they probably are not going to know that much about the person or the team or whatever we talk about today. You're going to know a little bit more. It's going to be a little bit easier. Um, But even more important than that, even more important than the point of the podcast, we have run into something that is incredibly, incredibly key to the future of this podcast, right? Because you said your name was what? So I, I knew this was going to come up. Um, it, it, it's formally Matthew Freck. Um, sometimes Matty Ice is acceptable. Oh. Sometimes uh, Flavor Dave is what they call me on the grill. No one says um, that. Flavor That's Dave. many people. Um, Dave. Yeah. Uh, so Matthew David Freck, I guess, would be what's on my birth certificate. Yeah. And depending where you're at and who you run with, it's Matt, it's Dave. It's, it's uh, whatever the people want, you know? Okay. So I-, I wanted to ask about this because this is something that I think about probably more than I should. I mean, you are my brother, so I, sh- I guess sure. I should think about you relatively often. But you have had the nickname Dave since you were probably in, well, like the fourth grade. I remember being, uh, we were getting picked up in the carpool line and we were calling, it was you and two other kids. I won't dox them just in case they don't want to be mentioned on the podcast, but they also, we took their middle name and gave them weird names. Uh, And yours was Dave, of course, because your middle name is David. And for whatever reason, that has stuck for 20, 30 years now. Uh, do you hate it or do you not care? Or are you like, man, I wish more people would call me Dave. Do people in your daily life call you Dave? And you're like, oh, I hate that. Or you're like, when someone says Matthew, you're like, oh, gross. Like, what is your thoughts on, because I don't have a nickname, right? Like I've never had a lifelong nickname. The most I've had a nickname for is in a freshman year of high school, the baseball team called me Shrek. Uh, and I think it was cause I was fat. I, I'm not green, so we don't have to worry about that part. But I've always wondered, like, what is it like to have a nickname that you go by? And then do you care? Do you like it or do you just not care? I think Shrek is apt. You are a hideous ogre. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I, I also would go with Sticky Ricky. as a, Okay, come on. Let's not let's not go there. <laughs> I've let's, always thought that was the strongest uh, candidate. but That's far too sexual for my vibe. <laughs> that's fair. I've always thought of it as like a um, a smell based sticky, kind of like a, a sticky aroma. <laughs> so you're saying I smell around. bad? No, no, no. Yes, you are. I mean, you're saying I smell bad. That's. I think that someone who called you sticky Ricky is saying that you smell bad. But okay, I would never say that. Mm, okay. um, Famously, but, we should tell the people of the podcast who don't know anything about us that I was born without the ability to smell. So if I did smell bad, it would not be surprising because I cannot smell myself. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. I mean, it is Um, a little bit. Like I could put on deodorant. um, I'm very proud to have a nickname. I do have one more thing to circle up on about my nickname. But first, I'll answer the question. I I love having a nickname. It's a solid one. I mean, Matt Freck is a solid name, period. But Dave is just like, you know, that guy you want to have a beer with. Um, Everybody knows a Dave. Everybody loves a Dave. It has a very special place. Like I, most people don't use it. It's very, um, it's Matt for 90% of the people I know. And so when someone does say it, it just hits right in the heart. It feels so nice. It's like, oh, oh you've earned that to be able to call me Dave. And oh, some people have said it and it doesn't sound like they haven't earned it yet. And so it's it's Ooh. just a very good way to know where someone's at in my life and how I feel about them. Because if they say it and they haven't earned it, I I just know I don't like them anymore. So, Um, okay. So let me ask you this. If when you said they haven't earned it, what if like, what if like Steven Adams came up to you and called you Dave, would he he automatically have earned it? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there is a coolness factor. Like there is a an X factor that certain people have that if they just, uh, even though I don't know them, right? They obviously haven't earned it. But so, like, if Kyrie Irving came up to you and he called you Dave, you'd be like, oh, no, 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 you haven't earned it. Uh, yeah, Kyrie. <laughs> he's. I'd probably take it from Kyrie. Mm, okay. Um, I'm thinking like if Denzel like used it. Oh my god! Yeah. Like oh. if he said it in a mean way, like get over here, Dave. I'd be like, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, Denzel could call me whatever he wants. That feels fair, right. But... Um, I do think it's time for the first podcast. I, I think it's a great time to air out some grievances. Oh my god! Okay. And I want to talk about Laser Dave. Oh, oh no! Okay, here it goes. Because to me, my my the nickname that was bestowed upon me by you is Dave, right? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure that at some point you created a gamer tag or an email that was Laser Dave, which well, I don't know why you do that as a big brother, but that's fine. I can tell you why. So then let's come back to it. Okay, uh, I'll finish, and then I. Obviously, being a younger brother, I look up to you so much. I want to be just like you. You're an idol. So no, you don't. Say. That's don't do that. Do that. That's not true. He's That's, a lying. It's not true. <laughs> but I start using Laser Dave. It 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 felt like a nickname for me. I don't know that anyone ever officially bestowed it upon me, but it felt like that. So I create my gamer tag, and then you called me out on it ten years later, and you're like, "That's your gamer tag. That's my gamer tag." What else would be my gamer tag? Uh, your gamer. <laughs> well, I think a... you're, I think that we both know your gamer tag should be salad shooter. Uh, that's fair. That's your original email address. Um, so the reason that I think I went with Laser Dave is because I really liked Calvin and Hobbes, and I wanted my own spaceman spiff, and so I thought up Laser Dave, and then and look here, I'm going to give it to you right now because I'll never use Laser Dave again, and I, you know, you, it's yours. You take it. I have better nicknames now. Putting it, putting it to bed. I love it. Sticky uh, Ricky is no, no, no. I, well, I mean, by you go with I mean, that. I mean gamer tags, which my current gamer tag and it will be forever because my WoW character is Tamu, which I then found out after I made that name randomly that it's the initials for Texas A and M University, and people are like, oh, you go to Texas A and M, and I was like, no, I'm eleven. <laughs> but, that's uh, fair. But, but that's what I go by every on all like gamer stuff now. So you can have laser. Dave I will keep laser. Dave, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I won't take it for you. Now I'm sure you're listening to this podcast and you're like, what the hell are these two chuckleheads doing talking about nicknames to start the show about ostensibly basketball? Well, the reason I ask about your nickname is because today we're going to be going to the career of a player with several nicknames. Uh, so while some know him as chocolate thunder, double D doc, Dr. Dunk, Sir Slam, Zandonkian, the Mad Dunker, Dunk you very much, Candy Slam, Sweet D, Big Doc, Master of Disaster, Squawk and Dockin, Double D Dunk, Sir Dunk, Dunk It, Pure Pleasure, Cool Breeze, Dr. Jam, or the Demon of Destin. Daryl Dawkins' life started without too much fanfare when he was born in Orlando, Florida on January 11th, 1957. So before we get into this, do you know much about Daryl Dawkins? Could have sworn you were going to say Desmond Mason. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know who Daryl Dawkins is. I know. Okay. So you, like if I said, Bare- what teams did he play for? You don't know. You wouldn't know. Barely, hardly. Daryl Dawkins. I want to say he was a Sonics guy. <laughs> Trailblazers also. Mm, well, he did. Also, he had, go ahead. He had a famous run in with some Trailblazers, but he was not yes. playing for them. I don't know what it is about those two teams other than geography, but I uh-huh. always like every time I think of a journeyman that played for one of those two teams, the immediate thing I do is say the other one. Like, I think oh, that's yeah, a very fair thing. Yeah. Sonics Blazers, Daryl Dawkins, Hawks. Yeah. 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 Uh, hmm, did he play for the Hawks? He most famously he played for the 76ers. What? Um, which we'll 80s, talk about. 90s. Guy. He, so he's se- early, late, excuse me, late 70s, early 80s. And then he goes into like, 89 or 90 ish. Um, so we won a title with Dr. J. We're going to get where we'll get there. We will get there. Okay. Um, and then I won't, he took I won't over as that. the new, he was like, get out of the way. Dr. J retired. Daryl Dawkins was better. Some call him like the goat of 76ers land. Mm, well, I mean, some might call him that, but not because of what you're saying. <laughs> goat of Philly. <laughs> the goat of Philly. Yeah. 
Okay. So while growing up in Orlando, Dawkins was mostly raised by his grandmother. His father, Frank, left soon after his birth, moving to Harlem for work and, to be fair, women. So not a very great household to grow up in. Dawkins' family did get indoor plumbing. Oh, excuse me. Dawkins' family didn't get indoor plumbing until he was in middle school. And he worked several odd jobs throughout high school, sleeping floors, helping at Charlie's Tire Shop for $2.50 an hour, and picking oranges in the fall to buy his mother something for Christmas. So this is the kind of guy, right, who not just like, how do I describe him? So he's not just, you know, like down on your luck type of dude. He is out there working all the time and he isn't just like taking the money for himself and his family. He's also out there giving it to kids, right? Like he is, yeah. he is, he yeah. is the king of the neighborhood. He's the kind of guy who everybody loves because he will go make that $250 an hour at the tire shop. And then instead of spending it on himself, he'll go buy like lollipops for the neighborhood kids or something like, you know, he's, he's like, he's like the sticky Ricky of Orlando. No, I remember because... you, you worked at Mazio's. I remember you worked at, do you have Taco Bell for a second? I did not or, work at Taco Bell. Or did you just go to Taco Bell with all of your Mazio's money? Look, I weighed 156 pounds in the fifth grade. So I went to Taco Bell a lot. Um, You worked at, was it United? I did work the at grocery the grocery store. store. Yeah. And then a very common complaint I've heard throughout your life is that you had to use all that money for gas and then you had to drive me everywhere. So, I mean, really, you're keeping the family together the whole time. Uh, okay. So let's not- Similar to Daryl Dawkins. I mean, we don't have to get into it, but let's just say that the family was not completely together the whole time, <laughs> if we're being honest. Um, yeah. So, you know, so this is the kind of guy, right, that had um, a tough life, but- a good, well, you know, not, I wouldn't say a good life. I mean, I shouldn't, I would not say a good life, but not like an easy life, but he was, you know, he's trying to keep stuff together. And then what you commonly hear about people like this, who grew up uh, impoverished, had a lot of trouble in life when they stepped on the basketball court, that's when things got easier, right? Like they could put it all away. Basketball was their escape. Okay. To say things got easier when Daryl Dawkins stepped on the court probably wouldn't be true. So in a 1980 article from Inside Sport, his high school basketball coach remembered, I saw people throw bananas at him, animal crackers. Once in a game at Winter Park, somebody said something about his mother, and he chased the kid right up into the stands. However, Dawkins continued to play at a high level and became one of the best high school players in the country had ever seen by 1975. That season, Dawkins led Maynard Evans High School in Orlando to the state championship while averaging a ludicrous 33 points and 21 rebounds. As you'd imagine, he was recruited by nearly every college in the country, but narrowed his choices down to Florida State, Kansas, and Kentucky. Now, so you don't know anything about Daryl Dawkins, right? So what I'm about to say, you're going to have, you don't, you're not going to remember this. Uh, I was born in 1992, so I now probably don't remember it. But you, you are, um, a, you are a basketball fan, right? You, oh, you would, 100%. You would, you would, you would, you would say you would... were better than a casual. I would say my expertise really starts with Tim Duncan, like like post Tim. Like I do a lot of um, Sporkle quizzes uh -huh. where you type in like, oh, who won the title in every year ever? And I can do like entire all-star teams from 2024 back to like 1999, like wow, 2000. That's impressive. Honestly, early 2000s is tough sometimes because, you know, you got random, just the most random. Players, yeah. Chris Kamen's. Anthony you know. Mason. Yeah, it's rough. Um, but yeah, pre that, all I know, it's like Jordan, Bird, Magic, you know, those geezers from the 50s. I'm those getting geezers. real like uh, Lonzo Ball vibes from Daryl Dawkins. That's very, okay. Uh, maybe... His life is just perfect until he steps out on the court. And then it's hard, you know, because everybody hates I, him so much. I wouldn't say his life is perfect. Remember, he didn't have indoor plumbing until he was and in, in I, high school. Sorry, I was <laughs> I was being facetious. But, yeah, okay. <laughs> Bad uh, attempt at a joke. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's get back into it. So th th the reason I ask that is because what we're about to talk about is he is like very, very famous for a very specific thing. So I'm surprised you don't know about at least this one specific thing. So let's just get into it. Three days before the 75 draft, Dawkins seems set to... Dawkins seems set, excuse me. Dawkins seems set to attend Kentucky before, before changing his mind and becoming the first ever player to be drafted straight out of high school to the NBA. So that is what he is like most known for. He is the very first prep to pros player. 
to this one of. that was Kevin Garnett. Sort of. Now let's talk about the preps to pros, whole the whole thing. Okay, so Dawkins was Dawkins technically was not the first ever preps to pro player. I know I just said that. That's not actually true. But so what I'm going to ask you, so you just said Kevin Garnett, right? Like, that's very interesting to me is like, you think it started in 1996. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So that is okay. So I thought you would think someone else because there's, a, there's another famous player that a lot of people would say, but is also wrong. Okay. So is it, it's, is it Kobe? It is not Kobe. Can I uh, guess? Can I, can you guess? Yeah. You could try to guess, but if you're guessing Kobe and Kevin Garnett, you are not going to get it correct. It's like earlier than that. It, I mean, it's earlier than Daryl Dawkins, and oh, he's in shit. 1975. So. Okay, Will would probably be like who no. everyone guesses. No, that's not. I mean, the one, no, no. Or Lou. Lou? Lou Alcinder. Oh. <laughs> was his name when he was drafted. <laughs> Lou Alcinder. Okay, no, not not Lou Alcinder. Uh, Any other yeah. guesses? Um. Yeah, Pistol Pete played in college, and he's not as good as Caitlin Clark. Um. I don't know. Are you just saying that to make me mad? 100%. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that's interesting. So I'm going to tell you who I thought you would have guessed because it's who okay. most people would say, even though we're going to get to him later. Moses Malone is commonly regarded as like one of the first ones, right? Um, which we'll talk yeah. about why in a second. It is technically true, but I looked this up. Interestingly, Tony Kappen and Connie Simmons were the first players to skip college and go to the BAA, which would later become the NBA. Kappen was a 5'10 guard for the Celtics and Pittsburgh Ironman, a team you probably didn't know was in the NBA, uh, though he'd been playing semi-pro ball since 1936 without ever going to college. So he is actually like relatively old, right? So he was drafted, I think he was like 28 or so. So a little bit different from what you know now. Simmons, on the other hand, was only 21 when he was drafted by the Celtics in 1946, which meant, Excuse me, which meant he'd carve out a 10 year career despite never playing college ball. So he didn't go to college, didn't do anything, just like waited a couple years and then got drafted to the NBA. Okay. But that's not even the first, but then it doesn't even stop there. Okay. So we have in 1948, Joe, I'm kind of pronounced this wrong, Grabowski would make a similar jump. But in 1962, Reggie Harden became the first player drafted the NBA straight out of high school. However, League rules required players who skipped college had to wait one year between high school and the pros. So similar to what we have now. So Harding was forced to go play in the lower leagues instead of playing with the Detroit Pistons. In 1963, the Pistons drafted him again and Harding signed, but he was kept off the roster because there was an ongoing police investigation <laughs> happening around him. He eventually did make his way to the NBA in 1964 and played for four seasons before drug issues ended his career earlier. Now, here's where we get to the part that a lot of people do know. Because in 1971, Spencer Haywood's case against the NBA went all the way to the Supreme Court, where it was decided that players could enter the league before playing four years of college ball if they qualified for a hardship, right? So this is this started happening a lot. Uh, Haywood's mother was raising 10 children while picking cotton for around $2 a day. So the money he stood to make after signing a six-year, $1.5 million contract with the Seattle Supersonics would go a long way to bring his family out of extreme poverty. And then you saw a lot of players doing this, like Dr. J, he got a hardship. Uh, he jumped, he did like two years of high school or of high school of college ball and moved on to the ABA, but a lot of it was happening over there. So then that led to Moses Malone making the jump to the ABA in 1974. So he went straight from high school senior to the ABA, no college at all, just went straight there to the ABA. He was immediately all-star in the league and was making $1 million over five years, despite being drafted in the third round. <clears throat> Two young players would see that success and decide to make the jump themselves in 1975, but this time they went directly to the NBA. So, of course, Daryl Dawkins famously is the first high school player to make the jump, but he was not the only player in 1975 because on May 29th, 1975, the Philadelphia 76ers made history when they picked Daryl Dawkins fifth overall and made him the first prep to pros player in NBA history. But a few hours later, the Atlanta Hawks got their own young gun with heaps of potential when they selected Bill Willoughby with the first pick of the second round. The journeyman center played for eight years using his 47-inch vertical to once block Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's skyhook, or excuse me, Lou Alcindor's skyhook. But this episode isn't about Willoughby, so let's get back to Dawkins. So that you just learned something huge. You didn't even know this. You thought you thought this started with KG, but no, it 100%. started it started 20 years before KG. And then it did it. Another player didn't do it until KG did it 
in 98 or uh, whenever that was, 96 maybe? Was he? No, he was even before that. Was he 95? KG. Kobe's 96, right? So KG would be 95 or 94 maybe even? Yeah. Um, which actually I have it written down. I, we won't get into it, but there's... That's pretty Duncan, so... Pretty Duncan. But there is a, a very interesting story about <clears throat> KG's jump to the NBA and like why he even made that jump that we will probably talk we'll about there. someday. Um, but I, I do think it's in, it's interesting to talk about some of these players because it's like the league specifically back in the day was like notorious for like low pay and mm -hmm. terrible working conditions and like a lot of racism, which, you know, going around everywhere, I guess you could uh -huh. say, but it's like, it, it probably was a lot easier to just be like, I am good at basketball and I don't want to go to college and let me just go play because there were a lot less people that wanted to play, you know? Yeah. That could be I true, mean, Michael yeah. Jordan would literally play against plumbers. They would leave the game and like go work at their day job. Michael Jordan. Yeah. Craig Maybe Elo, I think notoriously. Craig Elo was a plumber. Yeah. I'm just joking. But I mean, <laughs> I seriously, mean, back Bill in Russell, 1975, about, but... like they probably, not that they were begging people to come play, but. Well, I do want to say like, okay, you are in some instances, correct. There was a lot of players who were not that good in the NBA at this time, but I do want to point out that maybe this has been lost in my write-up of Daryl Dawkins, but this guy was viewed as the next Wilt Chamberlain. Mm. He was like supposed to be the next big thing in the NBA. And so can I just before we go on? Yeah. I know it's the first episode, but I might start with Wilt Chamberlain is just tall. Like, is he actually oh my God. good? Okay. Like, uh, you know, I just think there wasn't anybody like playing back then. So like, yeah, he's one of the best of his era, but I mean, LeBron is yamming on him all day long. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think you're necessarily wrong. I do think that the question is, is if Wilt Chamberlain was born in, how, when was LeBron born? Like 1986? Probably, and he has yeah. all the stuff LeBron has. Would he, like, what would the difference be, right? Like, that's the thing. Yes, I agree. Wilt Chamberlain probably, as he is, if you could, like, take him and bring him forward, it's probably barely making an Four NBA roster, a game. right? But if Wilt Chamberlain was born and had all yeah, the yeah, stuff yeah. we had now, what He'd would that wimby. look like, right? I don't know. He wouldn't be wimby because he's only seven foot tall. That's true. Wouldn't be seven How foot tall was Daryl Dawkins? Uh, he's 6'11". Okay, so that's why he was the next Will, because it's like, oh, great, a tall guy, cool. Well, I mean, like Moses Malone was tall, Spencer Haywood was tall. The guys we're talking about here are all pretty tall. So I think, I mean, it's just in that era, if you were tall, you know, Dave Cowens, Bill Walton, uh, uh, yeah. all those guys, you know, yeah. having a tall guy is a big Bill deal. Bill Walton, most overrated. Sorry, rest in peace. Bill Walton, most overrated. Wow. Okay. Just joke. He is, he is. I, I did do the statistics on this relatively recently that he is not the worst like MVP. But I mean, this is not that surprising, right? But I wanted to check the injuries. Out. But yeah. if after your MVP, he had the worst career, like after winning yeah. an MVP, even if you take like a guy who won his MVP, like Jordan at the very end of his career, and then he, you know, kept playing after that. Right. So like when he came back for Washington, he's still better than Bill. Wall. I mean, yeah, it's injuries. I was yes, just I know, yeah, no, I know, I know, his I know you're was very high, but What'd you I say mean, high? if you go look at like his total seasons, you're like, He's one of the top 75 players of all time. But yeah, I mean, obviously, won a title. Yeah. Respect. Yeah. I mean, it's always like, you know, that's always a thing about peaks, right? Like, I'm always, and this is a completely different sport, but I am in the camp of, at his peak, Randy Moss is a better wide receiver than Jerry Rice. But did he have the same career? No, he did not. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, for, that's a different topic for a different time. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Couldn't let's even go finish ahead. out a Super Bowl, but yeah. All right. So when Dawkins first got to Philly, he was playing with a ton of veterans who didn't quite know what to make of him. He'd routinely, despite being 18 years old, he'd routinely grab a beer after games and eat chocolate bars while sitting on the bench. Uh, Dawkins was rarely without his boombox, once complaining to the team doctor about a sore shoulder. The doctor reminded him. The doctor reminded him he was lugging around a seventy-pound radio, likely the source of his aches. So, definitely an interesting character we have here in Daryl Dawkins. 
And during his first two seasons, Doc mostly came off the bench, as I said. But in year two, the Julius Irving-led Philly squad made the playoffs. Head coach Gene Shu needed he needed some size to compete with the likes of Dave Cowens and Moses Malone. Fortunately, he had a high-flying 6'11", 20-year-old sitting on his bench. Dawkins nearly doubled his playing times during the playoffs, helping his squad advance all the way to the I put NFL to the in to the NBA Hall of Fame, <laughs> all the way to the NBA Finals against Bill Walton's Portland Trailblazers. The Sixers actually took a two-game lead to start the series, but during the second game, Maurice Lucas punched Dawkins in the back of the head after a hard foul on Blazers pal Blazers player. Bob Gross. Uh, so you can wa- you can watch this. It is absolutely wild. So a brawl erupts and you have like so essentially what happens is Dawkins like throws this guy, this gross guy. And when I say gross guy, his name is gross. Yeah, not that he is gross. Throws this gross guy on the ground, basically like sucker punches him. And then after that, Maurice Lucas comes up behind and just like pops Dawkins in the back of the head. Dawkins turns around. He squares up like one of those old timey, like puts his fist oh, up in the air. Oh, like yeah. he's ready to fight in the 1920s. And then just a brawl erupts. Everybody's out there. The fans start to storm the court. The court, uh, but thankfully, nobody was hurt, uh, except for Dawkins' teammate Doug Collins, who Dawkins accidentally punched in the face during the fight. So it's just like you should. Yeah. It's on YouTube. You should look it up. It is a wild, wild fight. Like one of the, I would say, one of the worst fights in NBA history in terms of like players or not players, players, not players, fans actually coming onto the court it's mm. it's not as bad as of course like the malice in the palace but it is it's up there it's pretty bad this is like 77 78 uh, i believe this is 1970 i think it's the pl- i think it would be the the finals in 78 it could be 77 but yeah right, right around there okay because i mean they probably really did square up like that until hulk hogan came in the 80s and taught us all how to fight oh is he who taught but, us that's who taught like us how to fight yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Hulk Hogan. That's, talk- that's how that's how he invented modern fighting. <laughs> it's Hulk Hogan. Yeah, right? Okay, sure. It's funny. Uh, we'll get there. But the things you're saying is funny because the stuff you are talking about actually plays into the story. You're welcome. But later, which is crazy. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. All right. So both players were ejected. And this is this is where it gets even more insane. A still oh, furious no. Daryl Dawkins tore the toilet out of a out of the 76ers locker room and then ripped the locker stall apart, barricading the door. In fact, his teammate World Be Free Buddy, said that oh, the no. other players could not even get into the locker room and had to talk him down from the cliff and let them into the locker room because it was barricaded in there so tightly. So oh, no. just like ripping this thing to shreds. Look, I know that, you know, Charles Barkley making fun of uh, Chris Paul for calling for the police presence uh, back in the day, but this team maybe did need a police presence. They set the precedent for sure. Uh, yeah, this yeah is- you can't be you can't be drinking when you're when you're in the locker room. I think some of these things are related, you know. <laughs> and there was there was a lot of drinking happening on this team, despite one of their players still being very young. All right, uh, so however. Uh, the team would go on to lose the finals after Dawkins got suspended. Um, it wasn't completely because of him, but the team did fall off the cliff and the, uh, the Blazers did win that championship that year, which, as you mentioned earlier, Bill Walton's only championship, and then he kind of deteriorated. Um, but his, excuse me, wow. Bill happened? Walton the go, I always say. Yeah, you definitely say that. Uh, Dawkins' performance uh, in getting the team to the finals solidified his spot in the team, and he would form a core alongside Dr. J, George McGinnis, world be free and Doug Collins. And that made them a constant threat to make a run in the playoffs. Like they were very good in this era, right? Uh, Dawkins was still coming off the bench for most games, but his minutes scoring and rebounding took a huge leap after that season. Despite the notable jump in production and 76ers winning ways, it wasn't until November 13th, 1979 that the Dawkins legend truly went national. Now here's where I'm going to stop down and ask you, do you know what happens next? Do you have any idea what he's like, even beyond the becoming the first prep to pros player, what like a lot of people know Daryl Dawkins for. Yeah. I, oh, okay. Um, I couldn't tell you the difference between Daryl Dawkins and Clyde Drexler at this point. I like, I know the name and I know it means something. And the fact that they're like seven, seven inches of difference in between the two of them. Oh, really? Clyde Drexler is a shooting guard. <laughs> Wimby's Famously, that is that is yeah. like one of the major reasons they didn't draft Michael Jordan is because they didn't know if they could play two shooting guards alongside each other. Oh, the Blazers. 
Yeah. Should have drafted Daryl Dawkins today. <laughs> Man, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Ten years um, earlier. Daryl Dawkins in the 80s. I know. Did he stay on the 76ers? Uh, he gets traded later. But but like for the right now, first half in, of the 80s? Um, The first few years of the 80s. Okay, they win a title in 81, 82. Yeah, they do. So... I'm he. I'm gonna guess that's what he's known for. Is he won the title with Dr. J? Got to let Dr. J right off into the sunset. Okay, um, let's let's see if you're right. All right. So this is yeah. remember this is in 1979. All right. Okay. Daryl Dawkins. Um, well, this what I'm about, I shouldn't have said it that way because what I'm about to say is not when he's 1979. Uh, Daryl Dawkins' first dunk of his life happened when he was in the eighth grade. The future big man was playing at Hankins Park in Orlando with his friends Snake, Jesse, and Pete. Around midnight on that rainy night. Dawkins attacked the rim and did something he never accomplished before, but would quickly become his calling card. I didn't know what the hell I'd done, Dawkins said in a 1980 profile. All I knew was all of a sudden, everybody stopped playing and their eyes got big. Somebody said, my God, you dunked it, man. I remember that feeling when it hit me. The feeling was, hey, I want to do that some more. <laughs> Just what a quote. Uh, and that is exactly what he did. While Dawkins was always one of the most ferocious dunkers in the NBA, after all, that's a big reason why he was always a league leader in field goal percentage. That November night in 1979 took things to another level. In a game against the Kansas City Kings, Dawkins saw his moment, elevated above every Kings player in his vicinity, and threw down one of the most powerful slams you've ever seen, shattering the backboard into thousands of pieces. Three weeks later, he did it again. Those at this time, the entire backboard didn't come down. Soon after, the NBA instituted a rule against breaking backboards, which eventually led to modern day breakaway rims. So this, I didn't write this part, but there is a quote. And I, I think it's this dunk. It might be a different one, but uh, his teammate, um, I think it's Doug Collins, but it could be someone else, was quoted as saying that after the dunk went through, he could smell smoke because it was thrown through the net so fierce that right. you could smell smoke because of the friction between the ball and the net. It wasn't like on fire, but you could literally like he's, he claims he was, I like, was going to say he's on fire, literally on fire. <laughs> yeah. It's like NBA jam, <laughs> but yes. um, so he was the first guy to break a backboard. Not the first guy to ever break a backboard, but definitely Sorry. like the most famous, like, you know how Will uh, and Patrick Ewing uh, in college specifically invented the um, uh, what's why can I think of the word goaltending? Right. They, yeah, had yeah, to, yeah. they had to start doing goaltending and like uh, the shot clock, like all this stuff. So he is the reason we have breakaway rims because he was just dunking through the rim so hard, just like completely taking them apart. And then like in that day, that day, it's going to take 30 minutes to get a new rim. So, yeah. You know, so like, I, I actually do know everything about both prehistoric and modern uh, rim technology. But for those who don't in the crowd, maybe we should do some explaining. Like, what's the breakaway uh, rim, and what was different about it? Um, okay, so I don't know the Darryl exact Dawkins. specifics. I am also okay. I am not a scholar like you, but uh, but uh, no, I I am. Yeah, and I but, would maybe on a different time I can. Yeah, you yeah. It up. Um, but what how as I understand it is the rims are if they do like the rims are more like they're springy, right? They have the extra springs in them, so they'll like the rim. If you were to break it, I think it would just break off and it wouldn't shatter all the glass. Mm. And also the the whole apparatus wouldn't come down, right? Okay. So then if that rim were to be dunked so hard to break, you could just like replace it relatively quickly. I think it's okay. So Dawkins was just like, we can't play anymore because oh, yeah, unless yes. they've got another rim in the back, because he would just ruin games. If, if you have never seen the dunk that we're gonna that we've talked about, but then I'm gonna tell you what it's called here in a second. You should definitely watch it because it is, I mean, this thing, you, you've probably seen Shaq shatter a rim, right? Like, yeah, you've seen, yeah, yeah. but this is like the entire black backboard just explodes and oh like glass gosh. goes everywhere and people run away and they have it to does, you know, it's, it's a very cool thing to watch in a highlight reel. The logistics of it are a little terrifying. If you're right there. <laughs> very scary. You know, yeah. Yeah. That'd yeah, be very that's, scary. That's not fun. I don't want to break a backboard. I mean, I would horrible. do it. I would do it if I could. Oof. I take that I, risk. You look I so don't cool. Know. Really? I think so. Yeah, but like, what if it's in your eye? Oh, um, that's a good thing. I would wear glasses. <laughs> if I'm James Worthy, then I will pull it up. James Worthy, what a pull. Wow, look at you, the basketball historian. All right, however, it wasn't just the dunks that made Dawkins famous. 
It was the names he gave those dunks. The backboard breaker against Kansas City may have gone down in the books as a normal dunk, but to Dawkins, it was the chocolate thunder flying. Kansas City? Sorry. What did I say? Uh, you said Kansas City. Was there a Kansas City team? Yeah, the, the Sacramento Kings used to be in Kansas City. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, the backboard breaker against Kansas City may have gone down in the books as a normal dunk, but to Dawkins, it was the chocolate thunder flying, robazine crying, teeth shaking, glass breaking, rump roasting, bun toasting, wham, blam, ga- wham, bam, glass baker, I am jam. And that was only one. And, and that was far from the only dunk to receive a name. So some of the other standouts include the in your face disgrace, the gorilla, earthquake or shaker, candy slam, dunk you very much, look out below, yo mama, this is my favorite, turbo sexophonic delight, rim rim, yes please, <laughs> rim wrecker, cover your head, spine chiller supreme, slam bam thank you man, walk away for walk away from love. And the Greyhound special, which is what Dawkins called it, and the rare moments that he went coast to coast for a slam. So this guy, you know, is more than just a basketball player. He is a magician with the spoken word. He's a wordsmith. And I I think it begs the question, did he need to be drinking so that he could be coming up (laughs) with all this material? (laughs) <laughs> was he trying to put himself in a good mood? Uh, you you may be right on that one. That's I mean, I, I, look, I don't. There's not like a. There's nothing about him that I've read that says he was on pot, but it definitely seems that way. Like I don't I don't know. There is a. You know, I, I don't want to judge anybody without knowing them. Yeah, but there are certain names that it's definitely more like yes, they they do. Um, partake and Daryl yeah. is absolutely one of those names. I, I've never thought or met a Daryl that I uh-huh. thought that ah, yeah, I didn't smoke weed. So <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. Uh, so in, in describing the backboard breaking dunks, Dawkins said in a New York times article, the first one was an accident, excuse me, but I wanted to see if I could do it again. When I got back to Philly, <laughs> all the fans were hollering. You've got to do one for the home crowd. So I went ahead and brought it down. Everybody was in awe. And this part is crazy. This is what you're speaking to. Fans were running out, grabbing the glass. People's hands were bleeding. I felt like I was doing something nice. no other human could do. Everybody says a dunk is only worth two points, but it gets your team hype, gets the crowd all excited and takes the starch out of other teams, especially when you dunk on somebody. And I always dunked on somebody. <laughs> It gets the people going. I love Daryl Dawkins. He's my new favorite player. I find it really interesting, and I apologize for getting this, but you know, Dr. J is known for the dunking. Like, yeah. I mean, I only know him. I mean, I know that he was good at basketball in other ways, but like what I know him from is the dunking. And he had a way better dunker on his team. He Well, I mean, okay. So that that I mean that does cra- the maybe question. Dr. J's craftier, but I mean this guy's <laughs> This guy's getting the crowd into touching the glass that he just dunked on. (laughs) Uh, So I do think that there is something there, right? Because Dr. J is just overall like an incredible basketball player, right? Uh, And Daryl Dawkins, while very good, which we'll talk about, is he's very good. In fact, we're going to talk about this in a second. Um, He was not super interested in being that great there is a a very famous quote that i did not put in here where he had a 30 and 15 night and as he was walking off the court he walked up to the team owner and said you better not expect that every night (laughs) like he he was not really interested in being the best he could possibly be he was just interested in having fun wearing a lot of suits like weird colored suits and uh as we'll talk about in a little bit Women, very interested okay. in women. Yeah. yeah. So he was not. So he I had think, vices upon vices. Yeah. Okay. I think that Dr. J was more interested in being a good basketball player. Daryl Dawkins was interested in living a fun life. And right. I think he definitely accomplished that in many ways. Um, but yes, I think that I think that a lot of people do remember Daryl Dawkins for his dunking, but he didn't. He wasn't in like the dunk contest. And also you have to think he's a 6'11 guy, right? Like his dunks are more like ferocious, right? It's power dunks. They're not. These like acrobatic, you know, going through the air, doing things in the air you would never see. It's similar to like why, I mean, obviously Dwight Howard did win some dunk contests, but why it's always less impressive when someone like Dwight right. Howard can dunk than like, 
I mean, I think Dr. J is like six, five, six, six. So not Nate Robinson, but you know, when a shorter guy does a dunk, it looks cooler because you're more impressed. So there is something there, but yes, uh, definitely. definitely Did you see, there was a recent clip. I, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm like 98% sure it was Wimby, uh-huh. but was there someone really tall in the draft? It was a really uh, tall Sarr? player that was just touching the rim. Oh, Edie? Edie, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Edie, I was yeah like, Edie's it was somebody so funny. Yeah. And it's just like, that's not it. He could dunk it every single time, and it's just not that cool. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> You're okay, right. great. You just turned around. Yeah. <laughs> turned around. <laughs> you just turned around. But I'm not trying to diminish all post play ever down uh-huh. to that specific thing, but he kind of just turned around. <laughs> Like, is being bigger than someone mean you're better at basketball than them? Sorry. I can. I know that we're getting into Shaq territory. I don't want to, I want to hate on Shaq too much, but I have actually talked about this and we can maybe, I mean, I don't, it's not really like part of this type of podcast, but I have, uh, I have posited that in comparison to other six, six players, six, six people, Michael Jordan is less impressive than Muggsy Bogues is in comparison to other five foot five or however tall Michael Muggsy Bogues is because there are not that many six, six players or people in the world. Right. So like, yeah, if you're six, six, you probably play basketball. Yeah. 50% of them are great at basketball. If you're five, five, you probably don't play basketball. Dang. This is, this is deep, <laughs> but uh, let's get back to Daryl Dawkins right, right. because we are going to run out of uh, time. They only let us have 40 minutes on these Zoom calls. The alcoholic okay. Daryl Dawkins. I'm just kidding, Daryl. We don't know. <laughs> As the Dawkins legend grew, so did his skill. While Doc never made an all-star team, he consistently averaged double digits for the Sixers while adding solid rebounding and the ability to block shots. Plus, with a signature junk, which is with his signature dunk, excuse me, he was always incredibly efficient as a scorer. That said, it was his antics on and off the court that often got the most press. In the 1980 finals against the Six against the Lakers, Sixers coach Billy Cunningham took a call from a sneaker executive in the middle of the series. Dawkins had been seen wearing a Nike shoe on one foot and a pony shoe on the other after signing a brand deal with both manufacturers. At the time, there was no non-compete clause, so Cunningham couldn't do anything to stop it. So this man just signed a shoe deal with two shoe companies and wore them both. Also, uh, it's the eighties and it's not Converse. Like it's, it's <laughs> Nike and Pony. Yeah. Come on. Uh, Converse would never let him do that. It's probably, probably. Yeah. You're probably right. Uh, later in the finals, Kareem went down with an injury, which seemed to suggest Philly would have an advantage with docking with Doc going up against a young magic jock Doc, docket, a young magic Johnson, excuse me. While Doc didn't guard him much in game six, Magic erupted for 42 points and 15 boards, and Doc got the blame. So then, in 1980, the team management was growing frustrated the team couldn't match up with Cream and the Lakers, so Doc was traded to the New Jersey Nets in a package that, somewhat ironically, brought Moses Malone to Philly. The next season... Philly finally won that title, but Doc was far from finished. So they he left, he was gone, and they won a title. So you're incorrect. He was not the guy that Thanks. helps it, Dr. J to the sunset. Uh, but it was a good guess. It was a good guess. Um, it was very close to happening. Uh, okay, so alongside Albert King, Buck Williams, and Otis Birdsong, Doc had two very successful seasons with the Nets. In 82-83, he led the team to its best record since the ABA-NBA merger, but in 83-84, he took his game to another level, averaging 17 points and 7 boards on nearly 60% shooting from the field. In the first round of the playoffs, the Nets were matched up against the defending champions, the Philadelphia Sixers, and Dawkins' former team. Jersey actually won the first two games, but then Philly stormed back to tie it in a best-of-five series. In that decisive Game 5, Dawkins only mustered four points, but his defense against Moses Malone helped turn the tide in the waning moments to send the Nets past the reigning champions. Sports Illustrated ranked it as the seventh greatest upset in playoff history in 2013. Sadly, despite Doc playing well in the next series against the Bucs, the team lost in six games, but things appeared to be headed in the right direction. And of course, when you say it like that, you know it's not in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, as it did with many big men of his era, Docs would soon would soon start to be hit by knee, by injuries. In 84-85, he could only suit up for 39 games. 
The next season, things appear to be back on track, but another injury forced him to miss most of the back half of the season, putting up more. Uh, what? I don't know what I just wrote. Another injury forced him to miss most of the back half of the season. Uh, and then in 86, 87, he only played in six games after being forced to undergo a second back surgery in less than two years. So obviously things are not looking good for Daryl Dawkins. Not that he cares because he's probably just abusing fact, alcohol. <laughs> as as we'll see, he might have uh he might have liked it a little bit too much. Uh <laughs> while his game was diminished due to injuries, Dawkins' personality was the opposite. If anything, the larger than life figure just became a more even outlandish personality. In 1986, he appeared in at WrestleMania 2 as a guest judge for the boxing match between Mr. T and Roddy Piper, which of course, was a great match. We all know that. It, it's very great when the WWE hosts any type of boxing match. It always works. Yeah, every time it's the, golden stuff. What was the What's the one that they did? Uh, the uh, Billy Gunn one where they had like shoot boxing matches and people were just like, I don't even know about that. And then he fought Butterbean at the end. I always think about um, Big Show versus Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> was, was, that, was that a boxing match or a wrestling match? Um, uh, I think it was boxing. Oh, okay. Well, the one I'm talking about, I think it was Billy Gunn. Maybe it's maybe it's Billy. No one something. should fight Butterbean in the WWE. So he, so it was. They thought what was going to happen was it was going to be Doctor Death versus uh JBL. Uh, but Billy Gunn or whoever it is, this other guy who was not like a star, knocked one of those guys out, and the other guy got injured at, in a fight, and so he ended up winning. And, and then he had to go fight WrestleMania, had to shoot fight Butterbean in a boxing match. Oh my and Butterbean just like hit him twice and it was over. Yeah, that sounds brutal. Yeah, um, I I need Daryl Dawkins, the the Daryl Dawkins. I need to go watch the Daryl Dawkins WrestleMania. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't do much. He's probably just like sitting there. Uh, but yeah. He also sounds like the kind of guy that just, he could be the Dion Waiters and get <laughs> the little, little screen time, but use it all up, you know? Yeah, true, true. Very, I mean, he definitely would use up that screen time if he got it. Uh, in 1989, he started in a very strange documentary that you can watch on Netflix called The Big Bang, Sex, Life, and the Cosmos, where he's credited as simply the basketball star and asked about his beliefs in God and views on sex, among other philosophical questions. And yes, I did watch his segments. Uh, it's incredibly any, any strange. Any good quotes? What? Any good quotes that we got? Uh, out there of is it? a point where they're asking him about sex and he's basically like, I would lie and tell them anything to get them in bed with me. So, and then, you know, there's, but there are some interesting parts where he's like talking to a child about God. That part's really weird, uh, but you know, whatever. Uh, but it I'm also interested. stars, in case you want to watch this, because again, it is on YouTube. You could just go watch it. Uh, it also stars Tony Sirico, who is Polly Walnuts uh, on The Sopranos. And <laughs> his parts are also very good, but a little bit more... Um, how do I put this like sad and real because he's talking about his life because he's like mm. a real life gangster. I don't know if you know this. Uh, no. Polly Walnuts is a real life, like actually in the mob type of dude. Okay. Uh, so his parts are <laughs> quite interesting. Um, all right, but here we go. This is where we get to the part that everyone knows except for you, but everyone who knows right. about Daryl Dawkins knows about this. His most well-known off the court claim is when he stayed. <laughs> Sorry, this is just ridiculous. Dawkins' most well-known off the court off the court claim is when he started to say he was an alien from the planet Lovetron, where his girlfriend Juicy Lucy lived. On his home planet, he pra he practiced interplanetary funkmanship, though mm -hmm. Dawkins never exactly explained what that meant. But it's actually like it sounds crazy, right? Like if you heard a six foot eleven man be like, "Hello, I am an alien from the planet Lovetron. Would you like to be my girlfriend, Juicy Lucy?" You would be like this man potentially uh, should be in an insane asylum. Here's um, the thing. Oh, I yeah, am a little like it. Sal on paper you read and it and it sounds crazy. Yeah, but it also sounds enthralling. Like <laughs> when when I meet a person and this is how they introduce themselves to me. Depending on how much I respect myself, <laughs> it could go a million different ways. I could be very interested in finding out all the things there is to find out about this person. <laughs> Planet Love Tron. Um, so, okay. So, but the thing is, is, and this is the part that I think a lot of people miss. And the reason, not the reason I wanted to do this podcast, but uh, the reason I wanted to talk about Daryl Dawkins in partially is because of this, because I think a lot of people miss what's actually going on here. Right. As I mentioned mm. in the start, his life as a youth is very hard, 
very difficult. It had to deal with racism, had to deal with uh, a tough home life where his dad wasn't around because his dad was out chasing women in New York. Uh, he didn't have plumbing. Like his life was very tough. And so later in life, Dawkins explained, Love Tron was a planet that I thought about in high school and everybody would say, man, you're crazy. It was just a planet in my own little mind that I could escape to. And it was a drug-free planet, you know? It was just, you go get your girl, and you go off, and y'all chill out somewhere. And it was Lovetron, and it was a lot of fun for me. I started to talk about it in Philadelphia, you know, and a lot of people would think I was crazy. But, oh, and I thought a lot of people would think I was crazy, but people said, I like that. So it was just like this thing he invented to kind of escape, right? The basketball court was not a really place he could escape, but to Lovetron <laughs> is a place Daryl Dawkins could escape to. <laughs> It, which is kind of cute in a way. Yeah. It, I mean, Lovetron really is the friends we made along the way. You know, I I feel for him. I think we all have that thing, that that thing in our past that we idealize and maybe are searching for. And this, that's what he had. And, you yeah. know, unfortunately for all the women he lied to, it, that's the way that it played out on those specific people. But uh -huh. um, I mean... It sounds like he just was a, a guy that was looking for that thing he was searching for, and he had a fun time doing it, you know? Yeah, for real. I think I'd like to hang with Daryl Dawkins. Well, I have some bad news on that front, but we'll get there in a little bit. Uh, okay. <laughs> Dawkins would eventually make his way to the Detroit Pistons, where he won a title with the Bad Boys in 1989, but he only played in 14 games. Now, if anybody belonged to the Bad Boys, definitely Daryl Dawkins, right? Like, he's a perfect person for it. He actually, uh, isn't it, is, I think it's Dennis Rodman that did that bad as I want to be thing. Hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure, though, that he stole that quote from Daryl Dawkins, because I think Daryl Dawkins once said that in an interview, like, years before Dennis Rodman said it. I don't want to put all of Dennis Rodman's personality on Daryl Dawkins, but I mean, he goes to the Pistons when Dennis Rodman is a young gun <laughs> up and coming Maybe as so. Daryl Dawkins on the way out. I think, I think he passed the torch literally. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say, so if, if I were going to be like, who is the patron saint of this podcast, if it continues to go, it is Dennis Rodman and it is Daryl Dawkins. Those are the two guys who like perfectly 100%. exemplify what the kind of stories I'm looking to tell on this podcast and maybe um, uh, some true crime because we're going to get some true crime eventually too. Uh, okay. So we're going to move on quickly because zoom just told me that we're only have another 10 minutes. So here we go. Uh, after that, he spent several years playing in Italy before playing with the globe trotters and then with the Sioux Falls sky force of the CBA alongside Manu bowl. Dawkins would stick with the game as a coach and sometimes player coach at lower levels until 2011 when he left his role as the coach of Lehigh Carbon County, Carbon Community College, excuse me, where he stressed school first and basketball second. A bit different from his own career, but Dawkins had had plenty of time to learn by then. At that point, he had also become a family man after spending much of his career chasing the ladies. So Dawkins was actually married four times. The first was to a woman named Penny early in his career, but the whole monogamy thing was just a suggestion. Uh, and, and they had their marriage annulled, though the two have a, do have a daughter named D Dara. Uh, his second marriage was to Kelly Barnes, but sadly, and this is this is actually, I should probably say trigger warning for suicide. Uh, she overdosed on prescription medication and passed away in 1987 while the two were estranged. That left Dawkins inconsolable. And after nine months of living off deferred payments from the Nets, he married a former cheerleader for the Nets, uh, Robin Thornton. That relationship lasted an entire decade before the two got divorced and Dawkins met his wife, Janice uh, Hoderman, while coaching in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we're about to wrap up here, so I'll just go kind of quickly. Hoderman had a daughter with Down syndrome named Tabitha from a previous marriage, but Janice made Daryl wait six months before formally introducing the pair. Tabitha had come to several of Daryl's games where he made silly faces at her in the stands, but when they officially met, they were instant buddies. In the years that followed, Dawkins did take that coaching job I mentioned earlier, but taking care of Tabitha and the couple's two other kids, a son, Nicholas, and another daughter, Alexis, became his favorite gig, which is fitting given how much Dawkins gave back during his career, hosting youth camps around the country and trying to give those kids the things he never had while growing up. After taking up that coaching job at Lehigh, Dawkins seemed completely at peace with who and where he was, saying, Lovetron is temporarily shut down for prayers, for prayers, for repairs. It may be shut down for the duration, I'm on the coaching planet right now. His former teammate, Fred Carter, probably summed it up best when he said, no one would have thought, including myself, that Daryl Dawkins would be a college coach. Daryl was never serious. That's the picture I had of Daryl in my mind. But all this time, Daryl was absorbing knowledge. He's telling these kids, meet your expectations because I didn't. 
I never saw it coming. Sadly, Dawkins passed away in 2015 after a heart attack. He remains one of the most interesting players in NBA history. Not really a bust, but also someone who let his love for living life and having fun get in the way of what could have been an all-time NBA career. However, I wonder if Dawkins would be remembered as fondly if he had lived up to that prodigious potential and not been the funky alien that captured the imagination with his gravity-defying dunks and creative way with words. Either way, I think Either way, I think it's clear that he not only helped inspire future players to make that jump straight to the pros, though it would take 20 years before KG opened the floodgates, and also help give players the freedom to express themselves on and off the court. So that is the story of Daryl Dawkins. Um, do you have anything you want to say at the end here? My what only would- theory left outstanding, I think, is that all those times that he was drinking, I, th- I think he was taking notes in the locker room. And I, okay. I I like to imagine that he had a, a little notebook or maybe a um, a tomb, an encyclopedia of Daryl, okay. and he gave it to Dennis Rodman, <laughs> and that's how yeah, for sure that's how it got uh, passed down to the ages. And that's well, I think we have Daryl Dawkins to thank for Dennis Rodman. Wow, that is I didn't think about it before I started when I wrote this, but I think you're probably right. That's a good good pull. Um, but yeah, that's the story for now. I think we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Do you have anything you want to plug before I read the sources? I'm, I'm loving the, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go check out ebay.com for uh, Daryl Dawkins jerseys immediately. So that's only right. sponsor I'm plugging today. Great. Uh, so the sources for this podcast, for this episode are Chris Broussard, New York Times uh, article called Pro Basketball, a game played above the rim, above all else. Pete Dexter from Inside Sport, uh, article called Daryl Dawkins, A Man Child in the Promised Land. And then the one that I used the most for a lot of this, Tom Friend from ESPN called Old College Try. I would highly suggest if you want to learn more about Dawkins, looking up Old College Try from Tom Friend. It is a very in-depth look at his life. It talks about a lot of stuff that I didn't talk about, like uh, how at Lehigh he proved that he could still dunk when he was like, 58 years old. So stuff like that. And just talking about also like a good relationship he had with one of his players who he saw a lot of himself in. So a very good article if you want to dive even deeper, but hopefully you have enjoyed this podcast. Hopefully we'll be back with more later and we can figure out our zoom problems because zoom having a time limit is very annoying, but uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off and we'll see you all next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Daryl Dawkins.